Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. As many of you know, Dr. Paul is in Phoenix today, and he's fighting for sound money. Uh, he's fighting for a bill that's in the state legislature there that would uh, make gold and silver legal money, and then thereby uh, eliminating capital gains taxes. So he's fighting the good fight in Phoenix today. Um, so I'll be taking over the, 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 the helm, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, President Trump's foreign policy and President Trump's campaigning and President Trump's philosophy. And thankfully, I'm joined by my old colleague. Uh, we worked together for a number of years in Dr. Paul's congressional office, and he's gone on to take over the helm of the Mises Institute, the greatest free market think tank in the world. Uh, Jeff Deist is with us. Jeff, can you hear me? Hey, Daniel. How you doing? Good to be with you. Oh, so good to have you back with me, Jeff. It's always great to, to talk because, you know, uh, the two areas that we both do are so important and they're so interrelated. Uh, people want to yes. take it apart. You know, throughout our time on the Hill, you'd hear people say, I love Ron's foreign policy, but I can't stand the economics. Or, you know, I love the economic stuff, but this foreign policy has got to go. And, you know, I think our mission as life is to try to connect it to and let people know that it's a package deal. Yeah, absolutely. This, it's this false dichotomy between foreign policy and domestic policy. If you look in the Constitution, there's nothing in there about it. And at the end of the day, it all comes down to, to the money Congress is going to appropriate, uh, the money committees are going to authorize, and the legislation that Congress is going to pass. Uh, and unfortunately, we have this additional layer of executive orders now that we have to stress about. But you're absolutely right. It, it's a phony distinction. And, and I always thought the people who said that they love, love Ron except for foreign policy, uh, you know, they really didn't get it. They didn't understand what Ron was all about because the same things that create havoc and death abroad create a government here at home that robs us and regulates us and steals from us and debases us. So uh, it was always interesting to me when I would hear especially right wingers say that I love Ron except for foreign policy because it doesn't make sense if you think about it. Violence is violence, force is force. And the justifications for, for it from a libertarian perspective ought to be equally narrow. In, in either context. It's kind of a no-brainer. The same government that can't run the Postal Service is supposed to be able to run a global empire of yeah. infinitely more complicated issues and so social interactions and traditions and, and all of this. So it's, it's absolutely true. Well, you know, one of the reasons we wanted to talk today, Jeff, our attention was caught, uh, both of us were caught earlier uh, this week by an article in Politico, the end of the libertarian dream with the question mark. And it goes through, uh, you know, beginning in Ron's two campaigns uh, and then on through Rand and then on through where we are now. And it touches on a lot of the issues that we're both working for. Uh, and it's, you know, it's just quite, quite a fascinating article. Maybe you, you'd like to sort of give a rundown of, uh, of, of what you took away from it. Well, for people who are interested, it was actually in Politico magazine, but it's available online just came out a couple days ago, and I was really fascinated reading it. You know, it, first of all, every time you read a libertarian article in, in an outlet like Politico or the Washington Post, New York Times, there's always this gorillas in the mist element to it, like they're reporting on this phenomenon that they scarcely understand. And, it, and I had to have a chuckle when they made it sound like the, the modern libertarian movement started in 2008 uh, with Ron Paul, when, it, when, of course, we can retrace libertarianism all the way back back to Confuci Confucianism if we like, but we can certainly uh, trace it back to pre-colonial England. Uh, we can trace it uh, throughout the 1800s with figures like Lysander Spooner and then later, of course, uh, uh, Mises himself. Uh, we can trace it throughout the 20th century. So um, I I'm afraid that Politico is guilty of the same thing so many uh, media outlets are guilty of, which is having reporters write about things they don't understand. You know, that said, uh, you know, obviously we're always happy and grateful to have libertarian ideas, libertarian thought covered. Uh, you know, my thought was reading this was when he's talking about libertarianism, I thought, who's libertarianism? In other words, they always go to the same old sources, the same old uh, people. I noticed David Boaz was quoted. He was quoted 30 years ago. He'll probably be quoted 30 years from now. He never seems to have much that's interesting or remarkable to say. Uh, but, you know, they treated uh, libertarianism as purely a political movement. They talked to Rand Paul and uh, uh, Thomas Massey and Justin Amash, you know, all good people doing good things in government, but they're also constrained by the realities of their parties, uh, by the, uh, the uh, chambers in which they operate, by the realities of fundraising, 
by the realities of primary campaigns. Uh, so really libertarianism is much broader than, than, than the political uh, end of libertarianism. So if we're talking about it as a movement, I, I think uh, a, an honest, responsible journalist would go beyond uh, Capitol Hill because I think libertarianism really emanates from the people. But that said, the one beautiful thing about this article was it really showed that we are making inroads against neoconservative foreign policy. Now, it hasn't gone away. It hasn't been defeated. It would have hitched its wagon to Hillary had she won. It'll attempt to hitch its wagon to Trump now that he's won. But the point is that over decades and decades, you know, people like yourself, people like Ron Paul, have managed to create a narrative that nation building, that U.S. imperialism is not the way to go. It's not in our self-interest. Uh, to, a, to an extent, Pat Buchanan has been vindicated. And for the first time in many, many decades, the neoconservatives are on their heels. They're having to explain themselves. Uh, when in the past, it was libertarians who were having to explain why what seems to be obvious to us is not obvious to everyone else, which is that we, we should engage in a foreign policy uh, b based on American interests, based on self-defense, based on uh, Thomas Aquinas's idea of what's justifiable violence. So it, it's, it's a wonderful development. And, and if the modern libertarian movement accomplishes nothing else but putting neoconservatives on their heels, I think that's a great achievement and one we should be proud of. Exactly. No, it's a good point you make. And I think it gives uh, people like this Politico writer and others that write about libertarianism, uh, it gives them the ability to sort of discount uh, the, the depth of the movement, the intellectual depth of the movement, because they simply write it off as, well, how many libertarians have you elected? You know, you've got a couple of them. It was the same thing with when Ron was in office. Well, how many bills have you passed? Meaning your influence only extends to where you have visible political power. Whereas we know the real strength, and especially both of us now that we're out, we're out of the hill and we're dealing with a lot more people, the real strength of the libertarian movement, the anti-war movement, uh, the anti-Fed movement is this huge under the iceberg uh, group of people that are out there that are so interested in, in learning more and in spreading the message. And it's so much more uh, important that way. But of course, uh, it's, it's not something that writers want to take a good look at. Well, you're right. It is something that's, that's far broader and far more meaningful than Washington, D.C. And I think it's a story that the media misses. They miss the story about Trump's uprising and they got it wrong and Trump prevailed and he prevailed handily. If we look at the Electoral College, I mean, he prevailed quite handily. Uh, so I think when it comes to the, the libertarian movement, you have to look at it in terms of its effects uh, in, uh, on the country as a whole. I think uh, now that Trump's elected, we're gonna find our progressive friends on the left are once again interested in these noble concepts of uh, states' rights and nullification. Uh, so I think that, that that's really where we ought to be focusing our efforts, politically anyway, over the next few years, which is joining with people who are willing to take a libertarian position on any issue for any reason, for any motivation. I don't care if you're anti-war just because you think Donald Trump is the devil and you would support the exact same uh, conflict or intervention if Hillary was president. That's hypocritical. I don't care at this point. Um, I, I think for the next four years, we ought to be thinking, or the next eight years, perhaps, we ought to be thinking about single-issue coalitions, and we ought to be thinking about issue libertarianism more than movement libertarianism, because I think there's room out there uh, to, to make the case that uh, it, getting involved in Syria, for example, is a bad idea. Poking the, the Soviet bear, for example, is a bad idea. Staying another eight or 10, God knows how many years in Afghanistan is a bad idea. I think that's, that's an area where there's broad agreement uh, across the aisle and, and across the ideological spectrum. So that's where we ought to get busy. And I hope that there is a flashpoint for that sentiment uh, among the aforementioned Rand Paul and Justin Amash and Thomas Massey. Yeah, you know, the, the thing that's, that really jumped out at me from the Politico article, and we've said it in, in a number of different ways, the same thing, is that Trump understood, the candidate Trump understood uh, the real deep level of dissatisfaction in the American public with our foreign policy, with the way things are going. If I could just read a couple of lines from it, I think this captures it. In campaigning for the presidency, Trump frequently sang from the same hymnal as libertarian primary rival Senator Rand Paul, warning against regime change and nation building abroad, decrying the allied invasions of Iraq and Libya, and promising to disengage from the self-immolating Middle East while reevaluating American involvement in NATO. 
So he got it, and that's why he was elected. And I think it's a great point. And as to what you just said, Jeff, I think that is uh, very, very important. Uh, and we get the same. I'm sure you get this as well when we do something that sounds like it may be in favor of what Trump's doing. Uh, we get lambasted for being pro-Trump. Uh, when we criticize him on another issue, we're being attacked for give the president a chance. You're anti-Trump. But it is about the issues. Uh, it's not whether we're in this camp or that camp. The issues are what we really do need to stand behind. And I guess that goes back to what we put up as our, as our topic today, the hot spots that we've talked about. And there are some areas uh, of concern that we have uh, in this early period of the Trump campaign. Uh, South Korea with the THAAD missiles. Uh, U.S. troops in Syria, as you pointed out. Yemen escalation, drone strikes escalating in Yemen. Uh, people like Fiona Hill being brought in as Trump's top advisor on Russia. She believes that Russia hacked the election. That means her boss is illegitimate. There's a problem. I could go down the line, a NATO tank exercises in Poland, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to keep our eyes on these things. We're not waving uh, our pom-poms uh, for, for anyone. It's about these issues. And, and you know, I, this is probably a good time to, to also bring up, Jeff, the fact that we are joining forces uh, really uh, kind of for the first time in a way to, to do a conference, to do a symposium on this exact thing, looking at these issues. Yeah, we're having a, a foreign policy focused event in Ron's hometown of Lake Jackson. It's coming up, I think, on April 8th, which is a Saturday, just about a month away. Uh, we're going to have David Stockman there. We're going to have the great Eric Margulies there. We're very excited about that. But I really hope Trump comes up because, you know, here's a guy. The good news, Daniel, is he's not an ideologue. The bad news is he's not an ideologue, <laughs> right? He, he's the kind of guy who's very susceptible, I think, uh, to the thoughts and opinions of people he trusts around him. So if he trusts neoconservative people in his administration, they're probably going to lead him down a bad road. And I, I personally think that, you know, his, a lot of his campaign rhetoric on foreign policy was great. George W. Bush, you could say the same thing. He talked about a gentler foreign policy. He talked about uh, a, a humbler foreign policy. And then, of course, he did the opposite. But what's really bothered me about Trump was the Yemen raid. I thought that was really the first big black mark on him as a president. M much of what we hear, the, the hostility engendered to him, uh, engendered against him by progressives and, and, and a lot of what I'm going to call dopey libertarians is, is really stylistic. They just don't like him personally. They don't like uh, his, his personality. They, they don't like the fact that he's this kind of outlandish guy. Uh, who, who's uh, very opinionated and very full of himself. But, I mean, that, that, that's stylistic, not uh, um, substantive. But when it comes to things like the, the botched raid in Yemen, uh, you know, that, that's really disconcerting. Now, if look, if Hillary had won, we wouldn't even be talking about the deep state. We wouldn't even be talking about the shadow government. I mean, that would be, that would be relegated to Alex Jones land once again. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the fact that we're talking about the deep state, the fact that we have this sort of open battle between uh, uh, various branches of government, various agencies of government and the media, I view this with with favor, not with alarm. I think it's, a, it's, it's long overdue. I think it's a good thing. Uh, and I want the American public to be disabused of some of their second grade notions of what government is and what government does. So um, I, I'm not a reflexive tr Trump hater, uh, but the, you know what, what he needs to do is focus on the United States and the U.S. economy. I, I'd rather have him, do it, have him do dumb things like impose tariffs that hurt our economy here than go kill people in Yemen. I don't want him to do either of those things, but if I had to choose, I, I, would, I would prefer that his is uh, focus be on, on domestic issues because right now the rest of the world just needs us to get the hell out uh, and and the united states economy uh, needs us to <laughs> re rethink what the fed and the treasury and congress are doing exactly you know and that's that's it's, it's such a good point but you know the president i think he does have a lot of good instincts uh Unfortunately, we both know what the neocons are like, especially the Beltway neocons. They are absolutely relentless. Uh, they, they position themselves as the only experts. Trump doesn't strike me, despite being a successful business person, doesn't strike me as being a particularly hands-on guy when it comes to these things. And so he'd probably say to Banner or someone, hey, get me some experts on Russia or whatever. And who are the experts? They're the neocons, unfortunately. And we have, until we can defeat that, and that's a battle of ideas, really. Until we can defeat that, um, 
there's not a lot of hope. But, you know, I do think he has some of the right instincts. He's outraged that he was, his phones were tapped, uh, you know, in a sort of a colloquial way, that he was monitored. Uh, and that's good. The, the bad news is that um, uh, we were all monitored. <laughs> you know, they're saying, where's the proof? Well, we see the proof now with the WikiLeaks. We're all monitored. Unfortunately, uh, he doesn't see the rest of us uh, also being the victims of this. So, you know, hopefully it'll be more of a, of a teachable moment for him. But we do have a lot of things to go over in April when we get together. We've got a great lineup of speakers. Uh, we've, we've already got a great group coming. I mean, tickets are selling. People are coming down here. Uh, I was a little surprised, but hey, Lake Jackson is a nice place. Uh, so yeah. we, we really want to encourage people. And it's so great to be working with, with you and Lou and the Mises Institute uh, in putting this on. So Jeff, I'm excited about seeing you guys next month. Yeah, it's going to be fun. And people have been down to Lake Jackson. It's, it's actually quite close to Houston, great barbecue. Uh, you know, a longtime hometown of Ron. Ron is kind of the uh, de facto mayor of Lake Jackson everywhere he goes he's recognized not so much for being a congressman but for having delivered about <laughs> half the people who are 40 years old at any given restaurant you might be in in Lake Jackson but um, you know let, let me make a final point on Trump uh, I, I've been reading up a little bit lately uh, from Harry Truman's oral biography and here's a guy who did some very bad things and and but but in many ways was was a humble guy uh, the other day, Ron was talking about how it would be fair to force Trump and his family to go through the same TSA treatment as, as us rubes have to do. Well, compare compare current presidents with Harry Truman. When Harry Tra Truman left office, he was effectively broke. Unlike all these, uh, unlike the Bob Doles of the world, he actually left D.C. and went back to his hometown of Independence, Missouri, where he was forced to move into his wife's family home with his mother-in-law. Okay. <laughs> And he refused to take a corporate job, let's say a board job or any kind of uh, um, uh, uh, advertising sponsorship from anyone. So he went and got a loan from a Missouri bank. And then he uh, actually made some money off his bi biography later. And in this oral biography, he talks about his regrets over creating the CIA. And he's quite open about it. I mean, he could never imagine all the digital apparatus we'd have today to collect metadata. When we talk about Trump's phones being tapped, all of our phones are tapped, our, our landlines or our cell phones. You can go back and collect that metadata. It doesn't mean that anyone's actively listening at the time. It just means that that data is available to intelligence agencies. So I think, I think Truman deserves a little bit of a second look. If you go back and read about what he said about the CIA, he said it privately to a trusted biographer. He, he continued to say publicly that the CIA was necessary as a consolidation of agencies. You and I remember that bogus line when DHS was being created, mm -hmm. the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, the Republicans were all telling us, oh, this is going to be a consolidation that's actually going to save money. Well, <laughs> yeah, of course, that's right. 15 years later, that's an absolute joke. <laughs> but the, the point is that politicians weren't always like this. Intelligence agencies weren't always like this. Uh, life in America wasn't always like this, Daniel. We, we, take, we, we, we take as normal too many things that are not normal. And, and I think that, uh, I hope that some of our, our speakers in Lake Jackson next month will, will really sort of make this greater point, that, that this isn't how a free society ought to operate. It's not how a free society ought to conduct its foreign policy. Uh, and, and it's not how free people ought to have to live under their government it, so it, it, it's it's not just foreign policy it's a, it's a holistic subject and and uh, certainly uh, david stockman and ron paul and lou rockwell and eric margulies are are people who are well equipped to discuss this amen perfect well that's uh that's great jeff it's great talking to you we could go on probably for a lot longer uh but uh we've we've uh We've, uh, we must shut the show down, but thanks very much for joining us, Jeff. I look forward to seeing you and a lot of our viewers next month in Lake Jackson. I'd like to thank everybody who tuned in today to the Liberty Report. Please tell your friends to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're getting up there in subscribers. We need a lot more. So thanks, everybody. Take care. We'll see you next time on the Liberty Report.
he won, it'll attempt to hitch its wagon to Trump now that he's won. But the point is that over decades and decades, you know, people like yourself, people like Ron Paul, have managed to create a narrative that nation building, that U.S. imperialism is not the way to go. It's not in our self-interest. Uh, to to an extent, Pat Buchanan has been vindicated, and for the first time in many many decades, the neoconservatives are on their heels. They're having to explain themselves. Uh, when in the past it was libertarians who were having to explain why what seems to be obvious to us is not obvious to everyone else, which is that we, we should engage in a foreign policy uh, b based on American interests, based on self-defense, based on uh, Thomas Aquinas's idea of what's justifiable violence. So it, it's it's a wonderful development. And, and if the modern libertarian movement accomplishes nothing else but putting neoconservatives on their heels, I think that's a great achievement and one we should be proud of. Exactly. No, it's a good point you make, and I think it gives uh, people like this Politico writer and others that write about libertarianism, uh, it gives them the ability to sort of discount uh, the, the depth of the movement, the intellectual depth of the movement, because they simply write it off as, well, how many libertarians have you elected? You know, you've got a couple of them. It was the same thing with when Ron was in office. Well, how many bills have you passed? Meaning your influence only extends to where you have visible political power. Whereas we know the real strength got to go. And, you know, I think our mission as life is to try to connect it to and let people know that it's a package deal. Yeah, absolutely. This, it's this false dichotomy between foreign policy and domestic policy. If you look in the Constitution, there's nothing in there about it. And at the end of the day, it all comes down to, to the money Congress is going to appropriate, uh, the money committees are going to authorize, and the legislation that Congress is going to pass. Uh, and unfortunately, we have this additional layer of executive orders now that we have to stress about. But you're absolutely right. It, it's a phony distinction. And, and I always thought the people who said that they love, love Ron except for foreign policy, uh, you know, they really didn't get it. They didn't understand what Ron was all about because the same things that create havoc and death abroad create a government here at home that robs us and regulates us and steals from us and debases us. So uh, it was always interesting to me when I would hear especially right-wingers say that I love Ron except for foreign policy because it doesn't make sense if you think about it. Violence is violence, force is force. And the justifications for, for it from a libertarian perspective ought to be equally narrow in, in either context. It's kind of a no-brainer. The same government that can't run the Postal Service is supposed to be able to run a global empire of yeah. infinitely more complicated issues and so social interactions and traditions and, and all of this. So it's, it's absolutely true. Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. As many of you know, Dr. Paul is in Phoenix today, and he's fighting for sound money. Uh, he's fighting for a bill that's in the state legislature there that would uh, make gold and silver legal money and th thereby uh, eliminating capital gains taxes. So he's fighting the good fight in Phoenix today. Um, so I'll be taking over the, 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 the helm, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, President Trump's foreign policy and President Trump's campaigning and President Trump's philosophy. And thankfully, I'm joined by my old colleague. Uh, we worked together for a number of years in Dr. Paul's congressional office, and he's gone on to take over the helm of the Mises Institute, the greatest free market think tank in the world. Uh, Jeff Deist is with us. Jeff, can you hear me? Hey, Daniel. How are you doing? Good to be with you. Oh, so good to have you back with me, Jeff. It's always great to, to talk because, you know, uh, the two areas that we both do are so important and they're so interrelated. Uh, people want yes. to take it apart. You know, throughout our time on the Hill, you'd hear people say, I love Ron's foreign policy, but I can't stand the economics. Or, you know, I love the economic stuff, but this foreign policy has got... ...outlets are guilty of, which is having reporters write about things they don't understand. And that a, said, yeah. uh, you know, obviously we're always happy and grateful to have libertarian ideas, libertarian thought covered. Uh, you know, my thought was reading this was when he's talking about libertarianism, I thought, who's libertarianism? In other words, they always go to the same old sources, the same old uh, people. I noticed David Boaz was quoted. He was quoted th 30 years ago. He'll probably be quoted 30 years from now. He never seems to have much that's interesting or remarkable to say. Uh, but, you know, they treated uh, libertarianism as purely a political movement. They talked to Rand Paul 
and uh, uh, Thomas Massey and Justin Amash, you know, all good people doing good things in government, but they're also constrained by the realities of their parties, uh, by the, uh, the uh, chambers in which they operate, by the realities of fundraising, by the realities of primary campaigns. Uh, so really libertarianism is much broader than, than, than the political uh, end of libertarianism. So if we're talking about it as a movement, I, th I think uh, uh, an honest and responsible journalist would go beyond uh, Capitol Hill because I think libertarianism really emanates from the people. But that said, the one beautiful thing about this article was it really showed that we are making inroads against neoconservative foreign policy. Now, it hasn't gone away. It hasn't been defeated. It would have hitched its wagon to Hillary had she... You know, one of the reasons we wanted to talk today, Jeff, our attention was caught, uh, both of us were caught earlier uh, this week by an article in Politico, the end of the libertarian dream with the question mark. And it goes through, uh, you know, beginning in Ron's two campaigns, uh, and then on through Rand, and then on through where we are now, and it touches on a lot of the issues that we're both working for, uh, and it's you know it's just quite quite a fascinating article. Maybe you you'd like to sort of give a rundown of uh, of, of what you took away from it. Well, for people who are interested, it was actually in Politico magazine, but it's available online. Just came out a couple of days ago, and I was really fascinated reading it. You know, it, first of all, every time you read a libertarian article in an outlet like Politico or the Washington Post, New York Times, there's always this gorillas in the mist element to it. Like they're reporting on this phenomenon that they scarcely understand. And, and I had to have a chuckle when they made it sound like the, the modern libertarian movement started in 2008 uh, with Ron Paul, when, it, when of course we can retrace libertarianism all the way back to Confuci Confucianism if we like, but we can certainly uh, trace it back to pre-colonial England. Uh, we can trace it uh, throughout the 1800s with figures like Lysander Spooner and la then later, of course, uh, uh, Mises himself. Uh, we can trace it throughout the 20th century. So um, I I'm afraid that Politico is guilty of the same thing so many uh, media 